According to your wish According to your wish My life is not my own My life is not my own I seek you in Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of all of the folks involved in the ministry of Bible Talk, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on in the study, this is a new study, we're actually in a prelude, the beginning of the study, in the Sermon on the Mount. And at the moment, we have been in the book of Galatians for the last week and, and again today. So we're going to do that because I want to talk about what I see as the most effective weapon that the devil has. Okay. We, we need to not be unaware of his schemes, his tactics, that we might stand against them. That's right. He's so, hard at work. He, he is very hard at work, and he, obviously he's been very effective, uh, yes. unfortunately. unfortunately. Yeah. So we're going to do that, but I'm going to ask first, if Alice, if you'll pray and ask God to bless our time together. Yes, Father, we just praise you, we thank you, we love you, Lord, and we ask that you guide and direct us tonight. And that the word that we receive would help us to change Amen. the way we think. And just touch all those out there who listen. And do your word, your commandments. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Now I'm going to start, but I want to read uh, a couple of verses from the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to read, in, and this is in the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount by the way. In, in chapter 7, I'm going to start at verse 13. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Mm. Now, it's not the only place in the scriptures that talks about this, that the majority are headed in the wrong direction. Right. Something to think about if you're into democracy, right? <laughs> and, by the way, I mean, when God led the people out of bondage in Egypt using the hand of Moses, one of the things he did was to warn them, do not follow a multitude into doing evil. Because the multitude is typically going to do what the flesh wants rather than what the spirit wants, right? So this weapon, I don't even know if we think of this typically as a weapon, but I see it as the most powerful, significant weapon in the hands of the devil. Okay. It's called Peer pressure. Amen. We want to do what the majority is doing mm -hmm. because we don't want to stand out. We don't want to be singled out. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about here today. I think peer pressure shapes the lives of so many. Well, peer pressure shapes the way that you think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It certainly. Now, the difference is to the, to the flesh, it may start by changing the way you behave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the way you behave will change the way you think. That's right. Whereas God's plan is that we change the way we think, and that will change the way that we behave. There you go. And certainly, you know, what Paul said in Romans is so apropos. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. Because if we don't renew our mind and think with, according to the Word of God, we're going to be acting just like the Word. We're going to be conformed. Like the world. To the world, mm -hmm. right? So, I'm trying to think, where do we start? It's such a powerful subject. Years ago, I did a very in-depth study in the book of Revelation. Oh, yes, yes. And I did a lot of study on uh, behavioral modification. And that, was, that became a science in the early 1900s. And I, in the, in the mid-1900s, there was a man named uh, Skinner, B.F. Skinner. Mm who wound up in Harvard for all of his life. And he was one of the most influential people when it came to behavior modification. And behavior modification is a real thing. I mean, either when you're born, you don't have a, you know, what's your behavior? You scream and holler until you get what you want. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's basically your behavior. So it must be the way you think. Because it works, eh? The thing is... You know, Peter says that we should long for the Word of God, the way a newborn babe longs for pure milk, right? Yes. I'm being distracted by sirens outside here. 
Hope they're not coming to get us. <laughs> the thing is, it's been proven over and over and over, and it should be evident to anybody that's paying attention, that morality has changed. Morality being the way we think what's, what's, what's appropriate, what's acceptable, and what's not. All right? So when I was a young man, homosexuality was against the law, literally against the law. It was prohibited by law. Mm -hmm. So it went from being prohibited, though, to then being permitted. Right. And once it was permitted, it, all of a sudden it became... Protected? It became protected by law, as it is now. And from there it went to being promoted. Yes. Homosexuality is promoted everywhere. Absolutely. In, in our culture today. Yes. As a matter of fact, it's not very, very long ago that the President of the United States at the time, Barack Obama, went to different countries overseas trying to get them to accept same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, and he tried to modify their behavior by threatening them with he would withhold funds yes. yeah. if they did not do that. And thankfully, some of the countries in Africa... They said, hit the road, Jack. Hit the road, Jack. They stood up against that. Yeah. But that's why behavioral modification works, by, by reward. Yes, yes. You, know, you, you do what, what seems to give you the greatest reward. But that's a pretty major change in thinking, for it to be, go that way. I, I, I give you a thousand examples, and I think you should be able to think of some. I will tell you that I, I was in the Navy back in the early 60s and the mid-60s, and uh, I was unsaved. Mm -hmm. And I cursed like a sailor. Oh, yes, you did. You've ever heard that expression, curse like a sailor? Well, the fact of the matter is, you walk, I walk, if I go into a mall today, you'll hear a lot of teenage girls cursing like sailors. Yeah. That's, that's that change that has taken place in such a short period of time. It's a cultural change. It's a cultural change. It's a behavioral change yes. that came about by the way people think. Yes. They do what they want. It's not a good situation. I mean, I can remember uh, the first time, I, well, let me tell you historically, I know this, I mean, I wasn't there, that cursing was absolutely, no curse word was allowed in the movie theater. I mean, in, I think it was 1939 that Gone with the Wind yes. broke that, when at the end of that movie, um, Clark, Clark Abel, Abel said to yeah. Scarlett O'Hara, yeah. uh, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Well, that shook the world. Yeah. How would that shake anybody in, the, in the, today? I mean... It wouldn't bat an eyelash at it. The, the problem is, you can't go anywhere without hearing that language that is offensive to God. Right. You know, you may have come to accept it, but that doesn't mean that God does. Right. Because it said, let no unwholesome right. word proceed from your lips. Right. So either we're going to be led and ruled or directed by the Word of God or by the culture, mm -hmm. which is why Paul said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about, is being changing the way we think, being transformed by the way, by the changing of renewing of your mind. Right. So I thought before we went into the Sermon on the Mount that I would spend a little time in the letter to the Galatians, because the letter to the Galatians is a real example of a spirit-filled church. Mm -hmm. A church that was touched by God. Absolutely. And all of a sudden, the Apostle Paul writes to them saying, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? There had been such a drastic change in the way they were operating. that Paul said, you've been bewitched. Well, in fact, they probably had. We need to understand that's a church. That was a spirit-filled church. Yes. And that's why I say, if we're going to go in and study the way God wants us to think by the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, you need to know that there's a danger that your, your flesh wants to snap back mm. and go back to the old ways of thinking all the time, to the traditions of men rather than the commandments of God, as it says in Mark chapter 7. Because that's what we've been formed into, the traditions of man, before Absolutely. we met Jesus. And the church, uh, 
I would say, is obviously still more ruled by the traditions mm -hmm. than by the commandment of God. I'm not, I'm not saying that as a harsh judgment. I'm saying it, I see that as a reality, all right? Where does that start? Well, remember here in Galatians mm -hmm. that Paul had said, let me just uh, look at this here a second, because he said in, in Galatians 1.10, Paul said, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still try, trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You will either please God or you will please men. Amen. I'm going to tell you, you can't do both. Because what pleases God does not please the mul multitudes of men. No. It's very few. Let, let's pick somebody, I, you know, in Galatians here, it really, really gives an example of how people filled with the Spirit, filled with the love of God, having been touched by the, by the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. can all of a sudden start going back. Right. And that's in Galatians chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading in verse 11. This is Paul talking a little historically here now. He said, but when Cephas, that's Peter, mm -hmm. when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. That's Here's Peter. Peter, who spent all that time with Jesus Christ, he was affected by the peer pressure mm. because here he now it says in Galatians, in Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Right. And Paul, Peter, they were all living that. Mm -hmm. But then when these Jews, Jewish leaders of the church, mm -hmm. show up from Israel, from Jerusalem, all of a sudden Peter is acting differently. Right. Right. He's not eating with those, he's separating himself once again. And by the way, that separation is a sin. Yes, it is. That's division. That is division, and the Word of God says, let there be no division among you. How can a man as strong as Peter be so quickly swayed from the truth and go back into the old ways, the old habits, and the old ways of thinking and doing? Because that's, that's man's nature. flesh. It's, yeah. it's that's man's flesh. Nature, yeah. Our flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's really difficult. Of course it's difficult. Yeah, very difficult. I, I promise you, you can't do it on your own. No, not at all. That's why you have to condition yourself, train yourself to be work, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Mm -hmm. you, God doesn't expect you to be able to do this. That's why, you know, it's like a parent saying, don't go out, this, don't go out by the street because you get killed to death by a car. You know, he said, and Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem until power comes upon you. He didn't want them to leave until the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon them in the day of Pentecost. Yeah. Because that gives us the power, that gives us the strength, that gives us the ability to do the things of God as He desires. Without that, you're not going to do it. Without that covering. You, you're gonna, you, you try as you might, you're going to fail. So, I mean, these are things to think about. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Right. Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Are you walking in the Holy Spirit? Otherwise, well, you're a dead battery. Well, <laughs> otherwise, you're in grave, grave danger. Is there any other kind? No. no. There's no other kind. All right. So, what do we do to try and make sure that we do not revert to the old ways of thinking yeah. once we have been touched with the new ways of thinking? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is very simple. By living them, by walking them, and making that same decision that Paul had made, that I'm going to stand for God regardless. Because when we talk about all of this behavioral modification, and, and you know, as I said, I, I, started, I did a lot of study on behavioral mm -hmm. modification back in the 70s when I was doing a major study in the book of Revelation. And B.F. Skinner was one of the people who was most influential 
in the, in the 50s, 40s and 50s in developing the whole concept of behavior model. It's all about risk and reward. It's all about, you know, you reward the behavior you want and you punish the behavior you don't. You know, when I, I remember those studies and I remember some, some of the experiments that you shared with us and I thought the one that was really interesting was the uh, they brought a group of people in and the wall yeah. and looking at a wall and they asked each person. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean what, what they had done is they had a, a, a group of 10 people. Mm -hmm. This was at a university and they were doing this study. And they brought in 10 people and they went down the line and they said, what color is that wall? And the first guy says blue, second guy says blue, the third one says blue, right on down the line until they get to the 10th person. Well, the wall is not blue, the no. wall is green. Right. The wall is green. Obviously green. Yes. It's not dealing with colorblind people. And the 10th the person says, uh, blue. Because there was so much pressure on him to conform to what the others had said. And, the, I mean, that was a study that was done over and over and over, with the results being the same almost each and every Now, those season. nine people... They were, they were part, they were of, the part of the study. But they, yeah. they, they were, were in they, on it. Yeah, yeah, they were in on it. They knew that it was yeah. green, but they said blue to see if this other person would agree with them. And there have been so many studies like that. I mean, that's such a, a silly little thing, isn't it? I mean, it, that's what that would caught my attention about it. Was, it was so simple. Of course it's, you know, how, how could you possibly say what those other people are saying? But if you're put in that position... But that's the point of the study, yeah, is yeah. to show... Something the, so simple as that. How easy it is to get people to change the way they act. Right. Now, that doesn't mean he thought it was... No, no. no. But he, he changed the way he act. To you can change the way you think, which will change the way you act. Or you can change the way you act, which eventually is going to change the way you think. Right. You know, Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians, he said, when I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, and, uh, and it struck me one day. The childishness was that he would speak before he would think. Right, right. We, we need to get to that place where we, we are thinking. Our mind is fixed on the Word of God. Our mind is fixed on Jesus Christ. Our eyes are, are fixed on Jesus Christ. We need to understand that everything in the world, and I, I'm talking about movies, television, radio, everything has a design mm. to get you to be conformed to the world. That's right. The unfortunate part is all too much of the church has fallen into that trap and is acting like the world. Mm -hmm. Okay? How do you know? Well, you know, you know how you know? You pray, you test everything according to the Word of God. Why do you think it is so notable about the Bereans in the book of Acts? Mm. That they talked about Paul comes in and teaches to the Bereans and says they didn't take his word for anything. No, no. They tested that when Paul pro preached, they would check the scriptures to make sure that what he was saying was the truth. Mm -hmm. You know what Paul said? You know what the book of Acts says? They were more noble minded. That's right. That's noble minded. Read Jeremiah 17 and see where it talks about if you trust in mankind, you're, you're foolish. But how blessed are the people who trust in the Lord, trust in the So we have to learn yeah, says, to trust the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. Cursed. That, that's what it says. Yeah. Yes. So if we're going to go in and study the, the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. and the Sermon on the Mount from, Roman, from Matthew. Matthew 5, 1, all the way to the end of chapter 7, is about, okay, you've heard it said, but now I'm telling you, here's the way you have to, you have to change the way you think about this. I promise you that everything in the world is going to try and bring you back into that old way of thinking. The old habits, the old traditions. And, and Jesus said, I mentioned in Mark chapter 7, he said, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God to hold fast to your traditions. We have built far too many traditions that simply don't line up with the heart of God, the word of God, and the teaching of the scriptures. These are perilous last days. You may, you may think that, oh, this, you know, that can't happen to me. I promise you it can. That's why we have to put on the helmet of salvation. We have, to, we have to protect ourselves. We have to understand that 
this, these are difficult and dangerous days. Yes, it is. How can you do it? Be in the Word. Okay? Don't follow a multitude into doing evil. Don't do something because everybody, everybody is doing did. it. Yeah. Because if everybody else is doing it, it's probably... That's a red flag. You know, when I was a child, I tell my mother I want to do something, you know, and she said, no, you can't, you shouldn't do that. I said, well, my friends are doing well, it. Well, my friends do it. Well, my friends do it. And she said, well, if your friends went up to the Empire State Building and jumped off, would you, would you jump? Probably so. <laughs> We're all lemmings. It's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just follow the crowd. That's what. We, that's why Paul starts in this letter of Galate to the Galatians. It's so important. He's not trying to please men. His desire is to please God. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that more often than not, when you are pleasing God, you will not please He's men. Saying. Because mankind does not think like God thinks. They hated Jesus, they're going to hate you. If you, right. if you are living and acting and loving like, like Jesus. But that's a decision that we have to make. We have to decide to do that. And then we have to understand that if we're going to go into the letter of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew, yeah. In Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And see, Jesus is saying, well, you've heard it said, this is what you, this, you heard it said Where? From the church. church. The teachings. From the teachings of the church. And so he's saying over and over and over, you heard it said, he's talking about the teachings of the church. He says, but I'm saying to you, and do it this way. Because they were teaching from the law and from tradition. How do we get so far away? Because I tell you, everything that Jesus said, he heard from the Father. Yes. Everything that Jesus said was the heart of the Father. How do we get so far away from the heart of the Father? A little bit at a time. Po, 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 po. Little by little. Because it's easier. It's more pleasant. How many traditions do we have in the church? I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I have to say it right now. It's like we are wrapped up in, in the tradition of the holidays, Christmas yes. and Easter. How much of that do you see in Scripture? Not at all. You don't. I mean, we have we have virtually ninety years of history, from the birth of Christ to the John on the John island of Patmos. Patmos. Yeah. How many times there do you see the church celebrating Christmas, mm. Not the birth of Christ? Not at all. Never. But what they did, they were dedicated to the celebration, to the proclamation of the death of Jesus Christ. We proclaim His death until He comes. Passover. Paul said, I have determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. Do you, you think that made him friends with the church? No. No. Why did he, why did he say at the last that nobody came to his defense? Mm. If you want to make friends, go join the 4-H club or somebody. I don't know. <laughs> if you want to be pleasing to God, study the word, know the word, and do the word. Isn't that the gospel? What is the gospel? Christ died. Well, let's read it because we have the gospel given to us, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Mm. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Amen. That's the Gospel. I mean, thank God they was born. And we have that account. But the simple fact of the matter is, he came in, he said this, when he was standing before Pontius Pilate, he said, for this reason that I came into the world. He was born to die. He was born to die. John the Baptist, the first thing, this is the first proclamation of the ministry of Jesus while he's alive, as he's approaching John and, and the River Jordan. And John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's the purpose of Jesus. From crib to cross. That, absolutely right. From the time he was in the manger till the time he got to Every Calvary. Step Every step. Every step. 
was to the cross. It was to the cross, because that was God the Father's purpose in the life of Jesus Christ on this planet. And it was done for us. Something that we never could have done for ourselves. Impossible to do for ourselves. To take away the stain of sin out of our life. Well, so that we can be with the Father for all eternity. But look at how many traditions we've built around the religious holidays. Why? Because it's pleasant. Because it's pleasing. It's pretty. It's pretty. Satan comes along as an angel of light. He makes it a It's a big, big, big distraction. Where do, where do you think peer pressure really started? In the garden? In the garden. That's a good one. Now, this is a little bit of speculation, and I'll admit to that. <laughs> you see, the woman... She took the fruit from the tree, which God had said, you don't eat from that tree. Right. And she ate from it. And when she ate from it, well, now she's all alone, right? So this is speculation. She calls, Adam, Adam, come here. And she says, Adam, come here. Why don't you have a bite of this? And Adam says, oh, no, no, no. God said, don't you? Just it tastes really good. And then she <laughs> says, everybody else in the world is eating it. <laughs> Which is a fact. <laughs> and he bent to the peer pressure. Yes. No, it doesn't matter what everybody else in the world is doing. It doesn't matter what everybody else in your family is doing. It doesn't matter what... You know what matters? It, the only thing that matters is what Jesus said you should be doing. That's right. So I, I think... Uh, well, we may do one more look at a few things in Galatians before we go into Matthew. But... Within the next week or two, we're going we're gonna to start in a detailed, I was going to say line-by-line line study of the Sermon on the Mount, maybe word-by-word word for all I know. <laughs> letter by letter. There is nothing as life-giving as the Sermon on the Mount. No. There is nothing that exposes the heart of God as much as the Sermon on the Mount. There is nothing that instructs us as to the way we should be Thinking, it's, behaving, it's, and living it's as the Sermon It's true Christianity. On the it is true Christianity. Absolutely. It really is. And it didn't take place in a cathedral. Mm -hmm. It took place on a little hill. And it was to his disciples, all right, training them. Because, you know, Paul said that whatever, Paul said that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. One of the things, the last one, it says profitable for training in righteousness. Jesus Christ had gathered his disciples to give them a word to train them in righteousness before he sent them into the world to do their ministry. If you're going into the world to do ministry without having a knowledge of the Sermon on the Mount, you have been deluded. You have been fooled. And you never want to hear anybody say to you, like Paul had to say to the Galatians, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So, Father, our desire is to be more and more daily, more and more like your Son, Christ Jesus. Lord, to bring the fullness of the truth of your love into the world, to touch other lives. Lord, I praise you and thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to do within us what we could not do on our own. To stand fast and not be swayed by the world and the things of the world, but the power to do your word. Thank you. We love you, Lord, and we desire to love you all the more. We desire to let other people see that love, experience that love, come in contact with that love, that they might come in these perilous last days to that place of salvation. Thank we you. ask that, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen and amen. amen. We are a peculiar people. Very, very peculiar yes. people called to show forth the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and Amen. into his marvelous light. Amen. Hallelujah. So be back with us again next week, and we'll finish up on Galatians, and we will head right into the Sermon on the Mount. Take that trip up that hill Amen. to find the truth. Thank in you, Jesus' Lord. name. God bless you and goodbye. Bye. Bye.